Hi, today we're going to talk about relapse and recovery. It's important to be able to understand, first of all, what recovery is about. Because if somebody has a substance abuse issue and they've been clean for, say, six weeks and they go out and use, and then they were clean for four weeks and they go out and use, and then they go out in two weeks and they go out and use, we wouldn't call that relapse, we would call that continued use. So it's important to understand what recovery is about. And to understand that, you have to understand the basic understanding of what addictions are about, and what crossing over the line into alcoholism and drug dependency is about. Now, initially when we're looking at this, I've been in the field for over 35 years. And in the process, I remember back in the early 70s, um, somebody came up with a theory that alcoholism was based because, uh, you know, for painters having a higher rate of alcoholism because lead was in paint back then and that they absorbed it through the skin. Well, that made some sense, but it didn't have any, didn't give you an understanding of how that, any understanding of how alcoholism had developed uh, for other people or even if that was really the truth. Um, you know, I mean, basically, you know, we understand if a person has developed, and I think we all, you know, come to an understanding, have heard this, that if a person crosses over the line into addiction or alcoholism, they've crossed over a line that they're not going to be able to go back to normal use of alcohol and drugs, which is true. So what is crossing over the line into addictions? You know, I mean, it wasn't like simply, you know, getting uh, some, walking up to some gypsy and then putting a curse on you that every full moon you go out and drink like a maniac. I don't think that ever occurred. I mean, it's not a matter of a curse or a hex or anything like that, or an omen. It has to do with several characteristics that are important to understand. One of them being a biochemical change in the brain that we understand people who are chemically dependent, alcoholic or addict, that in continued use of a substance, uh, there, is a, there is a natural endorphin that uh, normally is in the cerebellum, back here in the back of the brain where we have muscle coordination, and it's a very powerful narcotic that our body produces that if we, say, break an arm or or have you know some physical paralysis that this narcotic will or physical pain this narcotic will kick in help us be able to sustain maybe to, to survive okay but what happens with people who um, are cross over the line where the continued use of alcohol and drugs the this endorphin this endorphin changes from being in the back of the brain to the front of the, the cerebral cortex up here in the front of the brain from the cerebellum where and the cerebral cortex is where we make our choice making our decision making also where we get our higher euphoria so when this endorphin kicks in when we start thinking about the reward of going on drinking or using a substance this endorphin kicks in gives a person the a feeling of a reward, instant reward of, boy, I can't wait until I can get off work and do this. So that chemical change in the brain gives people the added reward system so that making the choice becomes much more difficult not to use the substance, okay? Along the way, when we're dealing with this, this chemical change in the brain, there are other characteristics that go along with addictions or alcoholism. And alcoholism is a form of addiction. Alcohol has been around for 10,000 years. It's just another drug. We have to understand that it's just another substance that we're dealing with addressing chemical dependency. So when we're looking at this, another characteristic besides the biochemical changes in the brain is that there is a personality shift that occurs for the person uh, who is chemically dependent. And this personality shift occurs with uh, understanding that a person who is alcoholic or addict can take a test, <coughs> a psychological profile test, one of them is called Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, uh, 
and it will register anybody who, subs who is chemically dependent as obsessive compulsive. That just means that the person doesn't know how to establish limits. Uh, they play hard and they work hard, okay, and because of that, they they tend to be compulsive or impulsive in their decision making. Now, not everybody who is obsessive compulsive becomes an alcoholic and addict. They may just be a perfectionist, but that's one of the characteristics of personality that you cannot change once it's established. The other thing is that if a person has these patterns of loss of control in their substance use, what happens is that they tend to have a reoccurrence. Another factor in biochemical influences is that there is a genetic predisposition that, you know, on an average is that one out of ten people in society become chemically dependent or addicted. But people who come from addicted families, where the parents were alcoholic or addict, um, there, you run into a 50% range of people who will become alcoholic and addict. And even if you take children separated at birth, you still have a higher percentage, somewhere in the 40% range, of people who become alcoholic and addict. Okay, so there is an understanding of a genetic predisposition. Also, we've identified uh, characteristics of genes that are associated to alcohol and drug abuse. One of them is called the high risk gene, which is associated to antisocial behaviors that people get into with alcohol and drug abuse. And they, you know, you might even identify as being some forms of criminal behavior that get tied, gets tied to that gene also. I like to think of it as a getting high gene instead. But along the way, that has a factor and in influence in people uh, becoming chemically dependent. The other thing that we talked about along these lines is the personality of the alcoholic and addict uh, that they, the person develops into an addictive personality. We talked about the obsessive compulsive nature of alcoholism and addiction that people can be tested for psychological profile tests, MMPI is one of them, and um, they will come up as obsessive compulsive personality types, which means they play hard and work hard. The person has difficulty being able to establish limits for themselves, and that's what happens is that, you know, that can fit in line with compulsive and impulsive behaviors that go along with addictions. Not everybody who is obsessive compulsive will become alcoholic and addict, they may just be perfectionists in their own life or in their work. But along those lines, because of that personality, a one factor, another factor is what we have talked about before, is if a person has a pattern of loss of control periodically, there's a sense of embarrassment. You know, when you receive a DUI, you did not want to go and tell your best friend or your family members that you just, hey, guess what just happened, I got a DUI. The person usually had some embarrassment associated to that. That embarrassment, magnify that tenfold if you have a continued substance abuse issue, and you'll see that the person has a sensitivity to how people perceive them. So the person uh, develops this personality also that's um, self-reliant, doesn't like to ask help from other pre people. They become independent. Um, and the last thing they want to do is to ask for help from other people. That's part of the personality. So along the line with this addictive personality, and along the biochemical changes, that it's difficult to see why, where somebody would actually take a risk in stopping using. What is it that gets a person to stop using? We want to talk about that. If they are alcoholic and addict, there are a set of circumstances that can occur in the person's life. We call them consequences. Okay, I had a friend of mine who was a teacher, and I remember him. Um, relapsing after about seven years cleaning and he was doing great and I seen him uh, he's addicted to narcotics I seen him in the uh, hospital and I I want to shake him and say don't you get it yet well what is it that gets a person to get it okay first of all I've been an addictions counselor for over 30 years and along the line I've worked in every facet of treatment of addictions and I've never met one I've never met one person walking in the door and saying, I think it's ethically and morally the right thing for me to do to stop using. 
I've never met that person because the reward is giving them something that they don't want to let go of, okay? And I'm not saying that everybody in this room is alcoholic or addict. I'm defining what develops, what the progression of addictions are about. So what is it that gets a person to ring the bell that they get? Okay, first of all, we look at consequences, okay? They end up getting a DUI. You know, people in these rooms, you know, a lot of them are DUI. Along those lines, you have to, you're required to go to these classes. You may have, you have to do urinalysis testing in front of somebody, you know. There's, you're taking, your, your license is taken away. There's a lot of ways that people are kind of treated like children. That would make anybody angry. Okay, so the first stage of awareness is usually anger and resentment. Now, why is that a stage? Because a person has feelings about that that gets them almost resistant to doing something about it. Now, I've seen people stuck at this phase before where they weren't able to resolve it. One fellow who came into the treatment center, I remember he was an engineer, and he had avoided dealing with it for 11 years. He avoided the police, he, you know, he had, you know, he, they would have arrested him for driving with a suspended license. So he finally came in because he couldn't get, a wet, get around the issue with any attorney not to do this. And he came into treatment. And you know what? He stayed an extra month after he was, had to go because he had a loss in the family and, and we worked on some of those issues. So he had understood the things that had gone on with him were caused by the substance abuse, but the resistance that came from his anger. Okay? Now people in these rooms now are beyond that anger usually because they're jumping through the hoops, they're in compliance, they're doing what they need to do in order to deal with the problem. Now if somebody is an alcoholic and addict, is that enough? Is compliance enough? <clears throat> no, it's not. And I like to share a few stories about these kind of things with people. I recall at one point in time working with uh, a fellow down in Tucson, or actually getting a phone call. And the irony behind this phone call was the, the gentleman was from British Columbia, and he called me and he said, and um, he had heard from somebody that I was an expert in the field of dealing with narcotic addiction. And at that point in time, I was working down in Tucson with narcotic dependency. And I said, yeah, I, I've been known to work on this issue. And he said, well, do you think, uh, you know, I have, a, uh, I have a son who's got a problem, and I think he's got a problem because he uses his allowance up every month. And I said, well, how much is his allowance? And he said, $30,000. And I, I thought, whoa. And he said, well, you see, I, run a, I have a series of department stores. I'm very wealthy, and my son gets a percentage of that. But I'm scared for him. I'm concerned. I said, okay, what can I help you with? He said, do you, well, I've got this idea that, do you think that you can use behavior modification to deprogram somebody? And I said, deprogramming like in, you know, getting them to alter their behavior? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, it's been used in treatment, but it hasn't been successful. What's your suggestion? He said, it would be worth a quarter million dollars to me if you could save my son's life. And of course, you know, I did, I seen this little Simpsons thing in my head of, the parting of the clouds and silver lining and hallelujah, you know. And I said, well, what is it you, you have in mind? And he said, well, I have a friend of mine who's got an island in the Pacific Ocean. If I got my son out there and you stayed with him, and you stayed until you knew he was going to stop using, um, then if that was six months, one year, two years, when you determined he was going to be able to stay clean, then you, you get your money. And I said, well, and I had to think about it for 30 seconds because we're talking about a lot of money. And I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, no matter if I think I'm that good of a therapist, no matter what I, I say in that, I have to tell you that it wouldn't work. And he said, why is that? I said, because if he's a real alcoholic and addict, he's going to know what I'm expecting of him and do exactly that so I get off his back. So compliance isn't going to resolve the problem for somebody who's an alcoholic and addict. It gets them at least being able to approach looking at things in a different way and trying some different ways, but they're not ready yet, okay?
So what is it that gets a person ready? Now you've heard admittance is a solution to the problem. Once they admit they got a problem, they got it licked, right? Not necessarily true. <coughs> because when a person gets to the point of admitting they got a problem, they're at a point in their life of recognizing what it got, to, what they did that got them there. Okay. Okay. Admittance. That's part of the solution. The other part of this, the issue that they don't have is understanding what it's going to take from here for them to maintain recovery. What is it gets that? What helps them to be able to sustain recovery? The person doesn't have a clue. Okay, I don't want to be malicious or um, self, you know, or put them down, but they're naive to the understanding of what it's going to take for them to get resolve this problem. Otherwise, they would have taken care of it a long time ago. Okay. So this, from this point on, the person has to be teachable to resolve the problem and try new methods to deal with it. Okay. <clears throat> Now, do they have it yet? Do they get it yet? They're getting it, you see. They're in the process of getting it. And along the way, in that teachable state, they're in a position of having some acceptance to what it's going to take in order for them to stay, to them to continue to be successful in abstaining from substances. Now, what I want to point out is that when a person, you know, we've heard about and seen um, this new, you know, method of, you know, people are going into private industry of, of putting people in space in the future. Well, I want to go back to this idea of developing orbit because originally when we started space travel, people would attempt the orbit and come down and crash, right? And what happens when people are dealing with addictions, they they attempt to get an orbit and they come down and crash. Orbit means sustained abstinence, is what I mean by that orbit. So what we want to do is be able to get the person to maintain a sustained abstinence for a year. Because when you think about a year and a calendar, you're going through every experience associated to change that would be a risk for the person, going through the holidays going through periods of time when they may have lost a family member, going through the summertime where it's time to party, other factors involved which could trigger a person to relapse and to use, and to be involved with support during this process to succeed in sustaining this for one year, the person has a higher chance of succeeding than, in, than others. Statistics show at one year to be about 70% other people will continue abstinence if they're on this route in the, initially. And that's, of course, going along with having internal motivation for change also, not just because the courts are telling them to, okay? But that's always a contributing factor, like we said, for getting there. The rest is what you need to do in order to continue with it. The person has to develop internal motivators of family, friends, realizing that this direction is not going to be successful for me, that I want to move on and live in a different way of living. A lifestyle change. Okay. <clears throat> now, one of the things I want to point out along these lines, in order for a person to sustain recovery, they have to remain teachable. You see, part of the issue here is that the person <coughs> gets to a point, and I'll give this example. Uh, years, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, they used to send everybody inpatient treatment. You got a problem, go inpatient, 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 inpatient. And they'd come out and they would relapse. They would go back to using. And when you talk to somebody who went inpatient, they got a sense of uh, trust that they may not have had in relationships with other people in the past. And they trusted this set of people in treatment, and they said, boy, we're always going to be friends. They, took their, they got their big books, they got these AA big books, you know, all they're in treatment. Everybody signed them, you know, I'll be your friend forever, da 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 Next, they leave, next thing you know, they never hear from them again. So that 
what happens is that I think that when a person gets into opening up, they open up a sense of innocence that they hadn't explored in a long time, and they get this perception of innocence of happily ever after. Well, it doesn't happen. Happily ever after is in fairy tales. So what has to happen is that if, as a person develops a set of support for recovery, they have to develop a support system. And I suggest people getting a handful of, it requires a handful of people, a support network in order to maintain a sustained person clean and sober. That's a sponsor, mentors in their life, long-term support system, okay? And one, you know, one of these people is going to go back to using, or two, One's going to move to another part of the country. One's going to get into a relationship and focus on that. So the thing is, is that they're going to constantly have to replace these relationships with other people to replace the ones that have left. And in order to do that, where are they going to find these kind of friends? These are not just friends who are going to be friends and say, how are you doing? They're the kind of friends who are going to willing to risk their friendship with you to tell you the truth. And that kind of honesty is difficult for people to reach for. Okay, but it's something you need to be able to look for for recovery to work for people who are substance who are chemically dependent. So along this direction, you know, I don't suggest that a person go into an AA meeting and say, "Okay, I'm going to trust this group of people. I'm going to share everything with them." That's an insane thing to do because there's some people in that AA meeting who are very sick. Okay, so you find a mature sense of relationships with people by developing trust. You go to a meeting and you hear somebody who has some really good things to say, two or three people, the next time you go to that meeting you're going to naturally listen more attentively to those people and feel more, feel more open to hearing what they have to say. As time goes on you may develop one of those people into that support network. So you develop these, these, this association with friends that become strong support. Okay, these are people who you call them and they're going to be there, and they 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 won't hesitate to support you in making the right choice for your continued recovery because the relationship is based on recovery, this type of relationship that you're working towards with these people. Now along the way, as we're getting further into this exploration of relationships, we we move into understanding. A concept of what why this is necessary because you see because a person has an addictive personality of self-reliance they're always at risk of potentially going back out okay and using substances that's always a risk it's a factor that they have to be aware of and where that comes about and how that occurs now when we see a person who has a history of real when, when we see someone uh, for example, I'm going to use this one example in looking at uh, of relapse, okay? And I'm going to use this oh, uh, first example of what progression of alcoholism addiction is. And progression of alcoholism addiction is kind of like this. You have periods where, yeah, there may have been uh, some planning out, they got a new relationship, they got a new job, things are working good, then they got impulsive and they reacted. They lost the relationship, they lost the job, they get a new relationship, new job. So it's kind of like this, okay? And there's another type of uh, progression of alcoholism I want to speak a little bit about <clears throat> before we go any further. And that's called binge alcoholism or binge dependency. And that is the person has a high expectations of their behavior and how they perform in conduct in society. So a lot of times these particular individuals will not use with other people, they will use behind the curtains closed and use behind closed doors. All right? But what happens is that they have the same progress, that same gratification reward system we're talking about in chemical dependency, but because they have such expectations of, of their behavior that they need to sustain, they will stay absent for a period of time, but in order to do that, they have to control people, places, and the things around them so that stress doesn't get built up, right? How, what happens when we try to control people, places, and things around us? It increases our stress even more, right? So the stress increases in a person's life. They may sustain the absence for six months. They go out, boom, for three days or three weeks or whatever it is, 
they crash, and then they get clean and sober, and it all starts all over. So it may last three months, three years, or two years, or one year. One person went out every nine months that I worked with. Another fellow I worked with had, usually he would stay sober nine months, six months, a year and a half sometimes. And this particular fellow, it's kind of funny, he was a, a longshoreman. Well, those guys usually drink pretty hard, but to his peers, nobody even knew he drank. But you know, every time he drank, he ended up getting a DUI. He had 11 DUIs when I worked with him over 11 years ago. Okay? And his behavior was consistent with this pattern. And I've seen other people with this. And really, they don't get along very well with the normal kind of routine alcoholics because they feel they're a little better than them because they don't drink like them. They keep it hidden. These individuals, you know, when normal people, you know what a shutoff valve is? That's where you turn a little faucet on, it goes on a little bit at a time. This person, instead of a faucet, they have a flood valve. They pull that sucker down, when they go out to use, it all comes out, okay? Now, if you look at the progression in their use, it still is progressive. They may have less consequences, they may drink longer period of time or use that substance longer period of time, but it's causing further damage to their personal relationships. All right? All in all, both of these progressions are consistent with needing to make a lifestyle change because things are getting worse. Right? Okay. So let's look at this in the light of what relapse can, is about. I'll use a, an example that is uh, an old wives' tale I year, heard 30 years ago about addictions is that if a person stopped using for three months, three years, or ten years or so, wherever they, how is it, wherever they went back to drinking in the progressed state is where they would end up, starting off down here if they started drinking. Well, that's kind of hard to follow. And I want to use some knowledge that we have about addictions today that we understand people are obsessive compulsive, right? And because of that obsessive compulsive nature, what we want to see here is that <clears throat> they're not just going to plateau out like this, are they? Things are going to start getting better because they're going to, they're going to get new jobs, they're going to get more involvement with family. Things are going to start working out in their lives, right? And, when that, and as a result of that action of taking care of things, the person starts feeling better about themselves. So why on earth would you think they would go back to using alcohol and drugs? What do we say about that personality? The personality doesn't change. The person with a self-reliant personality, I remember being in treatment myself back over 30 years ago, and the counselor said, you know, with your resentments you have, your anger towards other people, if we gave you a loaded gun in this and we're all on a desert island, how long would it be before you would be alone if we gave you a loaded gun? And I said, well, what time do we start? <laughs> okay. So the thing is, is that this person who has the addictive personality, I call it being defiantly dependent. Okay. They know they need other, other people in their life, but they really hate it. Okay. They don't like the feeling of vulnerability. They don't like to be in groups. So the person starts to hesitate and get away from some of this learn activities that helps them to stay clean and sober. They get some resentment towards some people in a 12-step meeting or a church that they're involved with. And for some reason, they back away from support with other people altogether. They use that as an excuse. They start working more, taking on two jobs because, by golly, I won't get in trouble if I'm working. Right? I've heard that a hundred times. And when that starts to happen, the person lets go of the support network that handful of people that's helping them stay clean, they've dropped off, okay, we talked about, and they start getting into this septic tank of thinking, you know, if you ever uh, go up oh, past Amity towards Salem, they got that, that, that uh, purification plant that really stinks, that kind of reminds me of what happens in a person's mind when they're all alone. It just sits there and spins over and over again, okay? A lot of negative thinking starts occurring. So what happens here is the person gets into more critical, critical behavior, and they start doing the avoidant behavior 
that they did before to avoid dealing with problems when they're drinking using and an avoidant behavior we call relapse behavior. Wow. <laughs> we call it relapse behavior now. Okay? This is behavior the person did, avoidant behavior of taking care of problems when they're drinking using. We used to call that dry drunk syndrome. Okay? I remember over 20 years ago working in an inpatient treatment center and the mother called me up with this one student client who uh, was let go of on a Friday and she called me on Monday and said, what's relapse, what's uh, dry drunk syndrome? Because that's what they called it back then. I knew there was something to the hitch to this. I said, so what is it that happened? And she said, well, you know, my son went out with some of his old friends and he came back smelling like alcohol. And um, I confronted him on it and she, he said, no, mom, we learned that in treatment. I call that dry drunk syndrome. I told her, ma'am, that's what you call a wet drunk, not a dry drunk. <laughs> so wet drunk syndrome is, uh, dry drunk syndrome, I'm sorry, is where the person is exhibiting the behavior of what they did when they're drinking using to avoid the problems. If that's, avo if that's uh, isolation, withdrawal, if that's using anger, aggressive behavior, if that's using humor to avoid dealing with the problems. What are the avoidant behavior the person had before? You see, that's important to understand because that's the behavior that your group of five people, that handful of people need to know that they can confront you if you have an alcohol and drug problem. You're not doing what you were supposed to do for your recovery. You said you are going to do. You're doing these other things. You need to make some changes if you want to stay clean and sober. There you go. And you need those people around. But you see, in the situation, you've shut them down. Okay? So, what happens is they make the decision at this point in time to go back to drinking and using. And of course, what I'm pointing out here, this feels, this drop feels like what they told me originally back 30 years ago would happen. Okay? That feeling. <clears throat> now, if you stop somebody, at this point in time, when they're drinking and, and using, when they made a decision to you to to drink and use, and you put up your hand and say, "I'm sorry, you can't. I'm not going to let you go out." How successful do you think you would be with that friend of yours? Zero. Okay. I'll give you an example. I was in treatment in a halfway house. I went through back third over 30 years ago. And a friend of mine from the halfway house called me after I was out for about a year and said he had been drinking Danny Chidsey, he was a Native American kid, <clears throat> and he asked for help. So I got another friend of mine who was also in the halfway house, we went over his house. Well, his bottle, drinking a bottle of, I don't know what, you know, pretty good, a good fifth, okay, that was pretty much gone. And he got up and he started coming at me. I'm a big guy, he's a little guy, so I. You know, he took a swing at me, I decked him, I threw him over my shoulder, and we pursued, proceeded to take him and dropped him off at a detox center for three days. Guess what happened? Three days later, he was back drinking again. Did my intervention stop him? No. And, you know, if I would have tried that today, I probably would have gotten arrested for assault. Uh, but the th fact is, you can't get a person to change once they've made this decision to use. All right? So the time to get them to look at this is when they're in this behavior, of the avoidant behavior, that you can confront them on. This is natural to happen to people who are alcoholic and chemically dependent, to recede into negative thought periodically. And the only way, the way to pull themselves out is through their relationships with other people that trust and support them. It may come from People, that handful of people, some of them may come from 12-step meetings, one will come from a church, one will come from work, one will be a family member, okay? They're going to come from a variety of places in that person's life. To give you an illustration of what happens when people get into this relapse pattern, I'll give you an embarrassing moment in my own experience being a recovering alcoholic and addict. Back when I was cleaning sober six years, I was um, the director of an outpatient clinic in Minneapolis. And at that point in time, I was uh, 
I remember it being this time of year, or I remember it being, I'm sorry, Christmas time around that vicinity and um, having to fill in for a lot of staff's positions that uh, they were taking vacations and of course I was slipping into that behavior and they uh, brought up to my attention during a staff meeting, my entire staff brought up to me that they see me in relapsed behavior.